Hello, everybody. I think it was chapter 974 where Luffy, Law, and Kid pop out of the water where I said that the track that was stuck in my mind by the end of that chapter was the overtaken track, the one that goes dun, 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 dun. Well, in this case, the track that was stuck in my mind when I saw Marco arrive by the end was the one that goes dun, 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 dun. Oi, pero spero. I was getting mad Marine Four vibes from that scene. You know, like when Kizaru was attacking Whitebeard and Marco stood in front of him, and he's like, Oi, you can't take the king on the first turn. And apparently, you can't climb the waterfall on the second either. Meow, meow, meow. Kevin does the same crane kick that we see King do when he sent the ship down. Perorin, 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 Perorin. The color spread looks amazing. The, the type of perspective that we get, uh, plus the lighting, the, the hues of orange that we get, makes you feel like you're there with them, listening to music. Uh, it's a little bit sad though, that even though Jimbe is now officially a straw hat, he, he's still not in the color spreads. Uh, then again, Frankie and Robin are not there either. So we're, we're missing the love triangle here. There's actually two glass bottles on the floor. And I'm wondering if those are supposed to be references to Frankie and Robin. Frankie, because one of them has a star on it and then the other one has a six on it. And though technically speaking, Robin is the seventh member. She's the sixth to join the crew. So I, I don't know, I, maybe I'm reaching. There are a bunch of quotes in the color spread, like the album cover that Luffy has says, every life has a soundtrack. And he's actually handing Sanji a disc of the Bing Sake remix. The quote on the table, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, because I think there's like a grammatical error to it. Because I think, normally I think the, the, the quote would be something like this. But instead, it says something like, music doesn't have to be a universal language and be translated. So it kind of implies the opposite. Uh, so that just might be like a mistake. Uh, but who knows? Maybe it says something different. There's also a cat at the bottom that has his back towards the reader. And his shirt says, music doesn't lie. And so that's a Jimi Hendrix quote. That's a Jimi Hendrix reference. We start off the chapter and right off the bat, in the second row of the first page, you can see Panda Man there doing a peace sign with his fingers. Uh, he's in the background behind some of the Beast Pirates. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Now, Apu got roughed up, wasn't KO'd. Uh, like I said in the previous review, Kid didn't use armament hockey with his attack. So I, I figured that Apu would be able to get back up. Um, and, I, and I like how Kid has a fan some kind of propeller mechanism attached to his arm. I thought that was a cool artistic touch. In the next page, we see there's like a gifter who seems to have some type of prey mantis power because you see that his arms are shaped like scythes. And then we get this great reaction from Queen who had placed so much trust in what Babanuki slash Old Mate had told them. And at this point, I have to say, there's just no way this is not inspired on the meme because he, he used it in the last chapter as well where you know queen is thinking back on what baba nuki told him and it's just like things are fine everything is fine this is fine it's fine this is fine now if you look at kid at first there's some distance between him and apu and so here kid does something pretty cool we've seen him do it before where because of his devil fruit power he can use electromagnetism to pull himself towards things uh, we saw him use the power in one of the previous chapters where he pulled himself towards a ship. And so in this case, Kid uses this power to pull himself towards Apu to confront him about being a traitor. And then later on, Apu attacks Kid and Kid just eats it up. I mean, I mean, this attack didn't phase him at all. Like he gets the, the slice and stuff, but he's perfectly fine afterwards. Like he was smirking afterwards. He ate that up. And so that was great to see because in the previous review, I was talking about how based on devil fruit typing plus kids experience with dealing with a poo, it wouldn't make sense for a poo to uh, catch kid off guard and deal damage to the same degree that he dealt uh, to Zoro and Luffy. So that was great. And then I also really liked the contrast of a poo telling kid, you know, you really shouldn't expect pirate alliances to work out. In other words, you shouldn't trust people. And then a couple of panels later, an archer shoots an attack at Kid and Luffy steps in to block the attack with uh, armament hockey on his leg. 
So I like that contrast of Apu telling him, don't, don't trust people, and then Luffy steps in to prove Apu wrong. I thought that was great. I can totally picture a scene once this is all over where Kit goes up to Law and he asks, you're in an alliance with this idiot, right? And then Law's like, yeah, pretty much, yeah. And then Kit says, how's it been for you? <laughs> and then Law's like, below average. Queen gives the order to go ahead and kill the Udon SKPs. And there's a beast pirate that has a, like as a bear in, in his chest area, but his ears are like his claws. And then in the next panel, there's a shot of Killer fighting off a guy with his spinning scythe. And then both Killer and Kid are just barely able to dodge this gigantic spiked club that comes raining down on them and that belongs to a very long-legged creature known as Hacha or Hakcha. It could be Hacha or Hakcha. And so we finally get the first official reveal of one of the numbers. He's no longer a silhouette, because we did see this character actually as a silhouette in the previous chapter. Uh, he appears before Luffy gets attacked by Apu. There's a scene where him and Zoro are running towards an army of gifters, and this number character is in the background. Uh, he has the same type of collar, he's pretty thin, so he pretty much matches that, that silhouette. I'm not gonna lie, it almost seemed like he was smoking something in the previous chapter. Now, I know some of you already took note of this, but there was a moment in chapter 978 where Queen was doing roll call, and so he called on the numbers, and the numbers sounded very, very drunk, but also each of their laughs has a number associated to it. Uh, so this guy that we see in this chapter is obviously the eight, right? because the pattern of his laugh, which is ha-cha-cha-cha, ha-cha-ha-cha-cha-cha, is based on hachi. Hachi means eight in Japanese. And in the same chapter, 978, where we hear the laughs for the first time, there's also a laugh that goes, kunyu, niu, kunyu. And so that's number nine, right? Because q in, in Japanese means nine, like the kyubi. And there was also a laugh that went gogi, gogi. And so that's the five, because go means five. And so it seems like numbers nine and five should also be nearby. Now what's interesting here is that Kid actually mentions that that number, number eight, that he sees looks bigger even than a giant. So I think we could take this to mean that numbers in scale are bigger than giants. I like how in the panel where we see Luffy, Zoro, and Kid arguing amongst each other, and then Killer's just a kind of like facepalm emoji, man, these people are idiots. We see some of the beast pirates, the ones that said that they weren't gonna fight, they're just eating and drinking, like they don't care. It turns out that Killer knows the weakness to a Pooh's Devil Fruit, which is covering your ears. And when I think about it, it does make sense that Killer would know that because he had enough time as uh, Kamazo, right, to be scouting Wano to find out information, valuable information that he could share with Kid. And then there's uh, a bit of murmurs there from, I'm, I'm assuming it's uh, some of the beast pirates that are talking about Killer and saying like, did you hear that he actually sacrificed himself? Like he ate that smiley from Orochi to, to have an opportunity to try and save Kid. And then Kid gets triggered by this mention and blows something up out of rage. And then Luffy's like, stop it, you're causing a scene. Want to talk. So a couple of things, Killer is ride or die, first mate material, similar to Zoro, similar to what Zoro is to Luffy. Uh, I remember in Stampede, there's a scene where Bullet is about to crush Kid into the ground with his fist. And then Killer actually kicks Kid out of the way and takes the hit for him. I wonder if Zoro knows that he already fought Killer. I, I, he, I haven't seen him mention it, so I'm curious if he knows that he fought him as Kamazo. Uh, and then another thing is that Apu, the fact that you can avoid his attacks by covering your ears, I'm not gonna lie, that was a little bit underwhelming just because, like, I was thinking it was gonna be more like the, the Choji situation that I talked about in the previous uh, chapter review, where like, even if you can't hear the sound, it doesn't matter, because you're still, you're still getting hit by the sound vibrations. It's kind of like glass, right? Windows, like window, glass doesn't have ears, but if the pitch is strong enough, it still gets shattered. Then we get a shot of Who's Who's crew, which has a major Captain Curl vibe to it because of all the cat costumes. There's a guy with another eye symbol there. And it's like every time we see one of those characters with the symbol, they always have their face covered. It's one of the reasons for why I think it's a third eye that they're hiding. Cause like, I don't know what else it could be. So who's who tells his crew, don't mind the Udon SKPs, just go find Yamato. That'll, that'll benefit us most. And so he mentions Sasaki as well because he's competition. And so again, based on dialogue alone, it does seem like the strongest of the Toby Ropo are Drake, who's who, and Sasaki. Now I'm just gonna read you this bit of dialogue from the official translation of the chapter, which has who's who talking about Queen. 
he says, I've heard enough out of Queen. That's who's who. And then he says, he wants to kill someone? Well, so do I. Does that mean that Queen is aiming to kill somebody else? Or is it, does that mean that they're aiming to kill each other? Because, I mean, my first assumption is that they're aiming to kill each other, right? To take out each other. But he says, like, who's who says he wants to kill someone? Like, he doesn't know who that someone is. So I'm wondering if Queen is aiming for another one of the Toby Robo. It turns out that Kinemon and Chishillian's group is going to be splitting up. One group is continuing forward towards the back. The other one is heading left because they're trying to pull a pincer move against Kaido. And so they get to this very nice bridge looking section on the side that serves as Black Maria's lair or headquarters. And by the way, just really quick shout out to the art in this in this scene because the setting looks great. There's actually a real life place in Japan that looks a lot like this. It's called the Kameido Temple. The gardens of the Kameido Temple, you have like wisteria blossoms all over the place. As the characters are in this area, I'm actually looking for hints to see if there's anything around that could give us information about what kind of prehistoric devil fruit power Black Maria could have. But all we get is a bunch of tusks on the buildings. Or they could be horns or fangs, you never know. So unfortunately there's not a lot of hints, uh, but I do think it's fitting that since Black Maria is so big that it was also the place where Kaido sent Big Mom to get her makeover because she's also very big. So the space would suit her. And so Black Maria's pleasure hall is essentially empty, which breaks Sanji's heart because he was essentially sucked in by his thirst. And then after that, we don't know what happens to Sanji. I don't know what group he decided to follow because you see Kinemon and Shishilian advancing forward and the other group breaking apart, right? But I don't know what happened to Sanji. Maybe he just stayed there, petrified like a statue due to his disappointment. Kinemon gives the order to his men to jump into the water to avoid getting seen by a figure that's opening up the sliding door of the pleasure house. Turns out it's, it's Olin, Big Mom. <laughs> a full face of makeup, a la Oiran or Geisha style, and she makes direct eye contact with Chopper, who freaks out, and I, I just envision this scene. If Usopp knew, I imagine like the Brachio tank going down the, <laughs> the little path, the little bridge, and then the sliding doors open to reveal Yonko Big Mom, and we just see the Brachio tank going slowly in reverse. Now, one of the things that I'm concerned about here is that it almost seems like this is the beginning of Oda pulling the Big Mom pirates away from the conflict and putting them in a corner. I mean, I hope I'm wrong and that he does end up using them properly in the arc, but you saw what happens in the chapter, right? Where we have this echo to the whole Olin situation where Big Mom lost her memory. And I'm not saying that that's the exact same thing that's going to happen here, but it does seem to be heading in a direction where Chopper and Big Mom have a special type of connection that allows Chopper and Big Mom to be friendly towards each other, and therefore it puts Chopper in a position of being able to use Big Mom to his advantage and to the advantage of the Alliance. And then you see what happens with her crew by the end of the chapter. And so there's a part of me that I was like, reading that I was like, wait, so are, are they just not ever going to get to Wano? Are they never going to get up that waterfall? Are they out of the game? Because if that's the case, right, I, I do have to question why bring the Big Mom pirates to Wano in the first place? I mean, if their role in Wano was going to be minimal, I feel like you could have come up with a reason to send them directly to Elbaf instead. That being said, I, I understand that this is a hard thing to do when you have so many, so many characters running around. And so, especially when you have another Yonkos crew, Oda has to really sit down and think about, all right, wh what am I gonna do with these characters here? And so to me, one of the things that could work would be, since you have the Big Mom Pirates in Wano, again, have Teach show up in Whole Cake to get that Poneglyph, that road Poneglyph that he needs. Oh, and by the way, by the way, because of this chapter, it, it's pretty much, to me, it's a clear guarantee. Guarantee, confirmed, almost, that Blackbeard, Marshall D. Teach, will show up in Wano. With, with Marco there, are you kidding me? ha 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 Marco Taicho! Can you imagine a scene where the Big Mom Pirates are on the ship, waiting to see if they can go back up again, and all of a sudden, they, they hear this tremble, and they realize there's a mirror aboard the ship, and then they see Blackbeard coming out of the mirror world because he's using brulee. Zee ha 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 ha, you want to get to Wano? Let's get to Wano! So he punches the air and creates a giant tsunami wave that carries the ship over the waterfall. Third time's the charm! Now if the Big Mom pirates are out of the game for sure until the end of the arc, the only plotline that I could see remaining open because of their absence would be the possible marriage 
between Yamato and one of Big Mom's daughters. But even, even then, that's still just pure speculation. We don't know for sure that that was the plan. But if it was the plan, I'm curious how that's going to be addressed with them at the bottom of the waterfall. Now for the Chopper Olin plotline, the best thing that could come out of that plotline would be if Chopper somehow finds a way of curing Big Mom's hunger pangs or, you know, stop her, like find a medicine for her, make a medicine that stops, puts an end to her hunger rampages. That would be the payoff that I would expect. Another thing that I see happening here is that since we know that Big Mom can be kind of gullible at times, like, you know, back in Holgeek Island where Pedro Spedo told her, oh, your, your wedding cake is with the straw hats. So if you catch them, you'll find your wedding cake. And so I thought it was interesting how it was the girls that left the tank, right? Nami, Shinobu, Kara, those are the ones who decided to go on the expedition to find Momonosuke. So I thought it was interesting because it essentially leaves Chopper and Usopp there in the tank. And you know how like Chopper was lying to Big Mom about, oh, let's go to Udon because they have Oshiruko there. But in reality, he only said that because they needed help to break Luffy out of prison. Now, Chopper is pretty subdued when it comes to lying, right? Because he's pretty nice. So his lies weren't all that bad. But Usopp takes lying to a whole nother level, right? So if they get Big Mom in a gullible mood, there's no telling what Usopp can get her to do. Like, imagine if Usopp tells her, yeah, you know, Big Mom, I actually heard that Kaido was planning on betraying you. And Big Mom is like, Nani? Now, there's actually a lot of hints sprinkled throughout the chapter that kind of foreshadow Big Mom and Kaido's alliance falling apart. Like for one, like Apu's dialogue in the beginning where he's like, you know, pirate alliances don't have happy endings. That's one. And then there's a conversation that we have where we see Big Mom talking about her ship arriving, but then somebody says, and I, and I wish we knew who she was talking to, but somebody says like, oh, there doesn't seem to be a ship at the port. And Big Mom is like, a port? Hmm? So she doesn't know that there's a port. And, and that's another thing. The Big Mom pirates are complaining that the, that the waterfall is the only entrance into Wano. So why didn't Kaido tell Big Mom, hey, there's a secret entrance you can use. It's essentially a giant elevator that you can get to if you sail through the waterfall or, or through one of the waterfalls. Because, you know, in that map, there's like two waterfalls. So regardless, there's a secret entrance and Kaido didn't tell Big Mom about it. And I understand why. Like I understand why two Yonko wouldn't trust each other enough to talk about their secret entrances. <laughs> All I'm saying is, is that this, this could cause some friction. If Big Mom finds out that there's a secret entrance and Kaido didn't tell him, her about it, sorry, <laughs> then that's gonna be a problem. Another quick note, as they're making their way up the waterfall, Flampe says something stupid like, Oh, I can't wait to become Kaido's favorite. If there's a Big Mom pirate that I could see betraying the Big Mom pirate, selling them out, all right, you know, in favor of Kaido, it's Flampe. Obviously right now, the Marco versus King matchup predictions are going off the charts. It's crazy. I think it's too much of a great visual opportunity for it not to happen. It'll be an aerial clash, right of the Valkyrie style. Dun da 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 dun dun da 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 dun dun da 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 I think people want to see cool things in their mangas, in their animes. I think that's great. But you have to think about it from a character progression standpoint. If this is actually a 1v1 that is gonna be taken to the end, right? If we're gonna, if we're gonna get a result out of this, what does it do character progression-wise for Marco and what does it do character progression-wise for King, right? Because one of those two has to be the one who wins. Like I can totally see them having a clash, like the type of clashes that Marco had throughout Marineford, right? But an actual full-on fight, an actual full-on 1v1, it gets tricky. I mean, we're gonna end up with a massive first Yonko Commander measuring contest, no matter who wins, if, if it's an actual 1v1. But then also think about this, if Marco wins, what does that do for Marco? Again, granted, the fight will look cool, but will it be more than just a measuring contest between the characters that are first Yonko Commander level? Because if that's the case, man, listen, uh, the Straw Hats need hard diff fights. All right, we need to see some hard diff fights, especially, in my opinion, for Zoro and Sanji. Because at the end of the day, the Straw Hats are the main cast. They're the ones that we need to see get pushed because we're following their journey to, to make their dreams come true. I have a question for the Zoro fans, all right? Zoro fans, if King fights Marco and King defeats Marco and then Zoro steps up to the plate, how are we feeling about that? Another question, flip side of the coin. If Marco beats King, then who's Zoro fighting this arc? 
I know, I know some of you are, are, are you know, speculating or saying that you would like Zoro to take a jab at Kaido because of Enma and Enma being able to hurt Kaido, but to me, that would just be, that would be way too much. That, that'd be a little bit too much. It's, it's going a little bit too far. Too far too soon is what I'm trying to say. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to keep the power scaling clean and accurate in this channel. <laughs> Marco being in Wano now is going to be a defining factor, especially when it comes to Luffy versus Kaido, or, or Kid and Law and Luffy versus Kaido, because he can heal people. Oda took his time to set him up as a healer. So can you imagine like Luffy being drained, like completely out of stamina, and then Marco comes in, and then he just kind of gives him the, the, the fire, and that, that's what like keeps Luffy going. Luffy's gonna need a lot of help fighting Kaido. And so Marco being here just makes victory that much more possible now. And so here's what I think is gonna happen, right? Because I do think that Marco and King are gonna have a, an aerial clash. Maybe not a full on fight, but a clash. But I, I've been noticing a pattern of Oda lying or having his characters lie so that the reader gets surprised or, or you know, to play with our expectations. For example, right? Kaido said to Big Mom, Lin Lin, if you come here to Wano, I will kill you. That didn't happen, right? Big Mom came anyway. Before the Wano arc even started, we had a conversation between Nekomamushi and Marco, and Nekomamushi said, so I guess you can't go, huh? You can't come with us, Marco, because you have to protect this village that belonged to Whitebeard. And so Marco's like, yeah, I'm pretty much gonna stay here. And then obviously, I mean, Marco just showed up. So, and by the way, now Marco can deliver that message that he was gonna give Nekomamushi to deliver to Luffy. Now he can deliver that message himself. Very curious what, what that message was that Marco wants to tell Luffy about. And then in chapter 956, which is the, the sword reveal chapter, right? There, there's a conversation on the phone between Kobe and Drake. And Kobe tells Drake, looks like we're not, we're not gonna be able to send the Marines over to Wano because we're busy with uh, you know, the Shichibukai system being rebuked and all that stuff. Which by the way, I think that's what gave Marco the confidence to go to Wano because if the Marines are going after Weevil, Weevil was the one who wanted to, you know, just, you know, try and find the Whitebeard Pirates to, to claim this treasure. But Marco says that that treasure doesn't exist or the inheritance of Whitebeard doesn't exist. Um, so I think that gave Marco the confidence to say, all right, the Marines are dealing with Weevil, they're dealing with the Shichibukai, I'm off to Wano then. But, but again, going back to what Kobe said, Kobe said like, oh no, the, the Marines aren't coming. So you know what that means, folks. We're gonna see some admirals here, at least one admiral. Green Bull has to show up. It's just a matter of time. Oda has been using the same thing where he has characters say one thing and he does the other. It's a guarantee. An admiral will show up in Wano. If my house had an actual working toilet, I would bet that toilet on this. I'm getting too many Marine Ford vibes for it not to happen, all right? By the way, this is the prophecy of the Throne Wars, all right? Do Flamingo Damas, Don Quixote, predicted this would happen, right? Straw Hat Grand Fleet on the way. This has to be the big event that the narrator was talking about by the end of Dress Rosa, before the World War. I mean, I've been listening to opening 13 on repeat and everything. I'm just gonna read you this quote really quick from Marco Taicho, talking to the Big Mom Pirates as they fall after being kicked by his Phoenix brand. Uh, Marco says, the next time you guys show up, the times may have moved on a bit more than before. Tell me that doesn't sound like him foreshadowing Marine Ford 2.0. There's literally a manga chapter in Marine Ford that is called, For the times they are a changing. I like how you see Nekomamushi's mink ship heading up the waterfall, and then you see Big Mom's ship falling in the foreground, and Oda tries to keep the identities of Nekomamushi and Izo a secret. Who are they? Like, I honestly don't know why he didn't show them. It's not like we're not gonna know who it is unless they're being accompanied by other white beer pirates and he doesn't want to spoil the surprise. Is, is Jozu there? Is Whitey Bay there? Is Vista there? Oh snap, what did I tell you about opening 13? It just dawned on me that Izo hasn't set foot in Wano for 30 years. 30 years. We got the Izo and Kiku reunion coming in, Straw Hat Grand Fleet coming in for sure. Admirals, my best bet. Teach, no doubt. It, it's crazy. Like this is, I mean, if you, if you can't tell the kind of chessboard that Oda is trying to put in play here, right? That he's trying to set up, right? 
This is the put on your seatbelts chapter. Marco showing up was the confirmation that I needed that things are just gonna get crazy. And then Oda has him say, literally say, this is gonna change the times. You know, after this, times are gonna be different. Big Mom Pirate feedback aside, I think this is a great chapter as a whole. Let me know what you thought about it down below in the comment section. You know what to do. Thank you so much. Catch you guys later. Take care. Doom, 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 doom,